Okay, hey everyone. Um, so thrilled to be virtually back in Kentucky. Um, Kentucky is actually the place that I've lived the longest in my whole life, even though I'm originally from Northeastern Kentucky and I now live in Southwestern uh, Virginia in Martinsville, which is about an hour south of Roanoke. Um, I'm also very proud to be an Al Smith Fellow um, of the Kentucky Arts Council. And I always um, make sure that, you know, uh, I always say that, you know, from leaving Kentucky, um, even though I do enjoy Virginia, Kentucky has so many awesome resources for artists. I've gotten grants. Um, in addition to the Al Smith Fellowship, uh, the Great Meadows Foundation has supported my work. The Kentucky Foundation for Women has supported my work. And so um, just love the arts community in Kentucky. Uh, for close to 20 years, I was the gallery director of the Claypool Young, uh, what was then titled the Claypool Young Art Gallery, Moorhead State University. I've worked for about 25 years in uh, museums and art galleries. I'm also a practicing artist. Um, I sell quite a bit and I, I teach a fair amount of workshops. Uh, this summer I was supposed to be at Aramont. I decided to postpone that because of the distance um, protocols that they smartly put in place. Um, but I do, and you'll see some examples of my work. Um, I do very um, uh, precise, uh, minute beading on fabric. So it's kind of hard to show people that when they have to stand 10 feet away from you. So, um, but right now, like my full-time job is I'm an assistant professor of arts administration and arts entrepreneurship at uh, UNC Greensboro. And I have a consulting company called Make Do Creative. Um, and I do quite a bit of presentations like this. Um, and we're gonna go through this information really quickly. Um, put your questions in the chat. I hope that we'll have time um, for to chat about that. Um, but what we're gonna talk about today is branding basics and how you think about your brand and how you use that to create a clear and consistent narrative about your work and images and text and how that lives in the print um, and digital marketing space. So, um, so this is what we're gonna talk about today uh, fairly quickly. Like, what does it mean when we say branding and you, know, you, ne you need to brand yourself as an artist or a creative? Um, and how we can come up with some information. I'm gonna show you a lot of examples and I'm gonna go over a couple um, activities for you that you'll be able to do on your own time um, that will be helpful, I hope, in helping you kind of think about who you are, what you do, how you wanna communicate that, and then things that are necessary for you to have to, to communicate that. So it's gonna be fast moving, there will be activities. Um, you can do those activities on your own. So you're gonna hear me say consistent so many times that you're probably gonna get really sick of it. But um, when, and I've been, um, I think twice um, a, a panelist for Kentucky Crafted and I have done a fair amount of adjudication work uh, like for the Woodland um, Art Fair and other um, shows and exhibitions. And, and con consistency is key, okay? So I'm saying it over and over again for a reason. Um, and we're gonna look at examples of what do I mean when I say consistent. So what is branding? So branding is one of those words like networking that's a little icky. So think about branding as your artistic or your aesthetic identity. Um, it, it is basically who, who you are, what you make, um, and how you communicate that. So um, there are a fair amount of books about this. Um, a person who is actually a um, brand strategist told me about this book, which I bought and it's excellent. It talks about branding as a story and sort of coming up with the story of um, your artistic product and how you communicate that uh, to your marketplace through the strategic channels that are most appropriate um, for your end, end user. We're not going to talk a ton about end users, but I always joke 
that, um, you know, my end user tends to be mid forties to mid seventies. So I don't do a lot of marketing on TikTok. Um, I, I do a lot of marketing on, on Facebook because that's where my end user is. So we think about, you know, what's that brand? And so with, with my artistic product and some, hopefully some of you get this reference, I always joke that sort of my art making practice and like who I am in workshops is like if Jackie O and uh, little Edie had a baby. So, um, and you'll see with my work that there's a level of sort of whimsy in it, um, kind of kitsch, a little bit of over the top. Um, and it is a little, I won't, it's a little on the humorous side. So let's look at some just, um, some examples from Kentucky of creatives who I think have a real strong brand, um, understanding of their brand and a strong communication of that brand. So the first one is Cricket Press. And so we have their website um, and then we have a, a screenshot of their Instagram. So you can see same sort of visuals. It's clear that this is like the same entity um, cross-platform. And let me forward here. Uh, Lori LaRusso, and I just recently bought a piece um, uh, from Lori. Um, so Lori LaRusso's Instagram is there on the left. Um, and then you can see a snapshot of her website um, on the right. So again, consistent consistency. Um, and then a former um, student of mine who is now a creative director at Cornette um, Advertising that's in downtown Lexington, he has developed a line of uh, beverages. And so you can see his Instagram there on the left, kind of more of a sort of telling that story. There are some product shots, but there's also images that go along with the product where it has his e-commerce that is on the right, you know, is product focused, but that same aesthetic. And he, he's really, he's kind of going with that monochromatic, um, you know, sort of color story that crosses um, between the two uh, platforms. This is a ceramicist um, who's out of um, England and so you can see her Instagram, her e-commerce, and her Facebook. Uh, again, someone who has a pretty strong color story. Um, it's either achromatic or monochromatic. You know, she's got those warm grays, um, uh, you know, light gray, dark gray, but then she's got those um, spots of, of blue there. But She's keeping it super, super consistent. You can see that her profile pic is the same on her Facebook and her Instagram. So one of the first activities that I suggest people do is a venture inventory. And so this is a matrix where you provide bits of information. This is a lot easier to do than to just say, okay, I have to write a paragraph about myself and write down two to three words that, you know, talks about who you are as a maker, what you make, why do you make it, how do you make it, and then for the marketing piece, uh, for whom do you make it for? So just to run through this for my example, um, as a textile artist, well, that's one of the things I would put in, in you. I am a textile artist. Um, who was trained uh, with, a, with a BFA and a master's in fine arts, but I work in sort of the craft space. So that explains me as a maker. What do I make? I make um, hand stitched and embellished textile assemblages. Why do I make them? Because I like to um, explore female iconography within a heavily embellished decorative format. How do I make it? I stitch. I incorporate found objects. Um, I lay out the compositions. Um, I also communicate about my work online. For whom? For whom it tends to be women. 
Um, the people who buy my work do tend to be, you know, in that mid 40s to early 70s uh, range, and they tend to, you know, have disposable income, they tend to be college educated, and they tend to be, you know, art appreciators. So when you're starting to think about your brand, and we're going to have an exercise here in a moment, it's helpful to use something like Pinterest um, or just collecting images that kind of tell the story of your, your brand. And so one of the other things I do, and you'll notice when I show you a screenshot of my, of my art website, this is not on my art website, um, this is Indigo Shibori. And so um, I will sell, and I, I do have an Etsy, and I know you all talked about e-commerce before. Um, I pivoted my um, Indigo Shibori like silk and wool scarves. I pivoted them to silk and uh, cotton masks um, in April when I found out that my workshops for this summer were canceled. And so I was able to do that pivot and use Etsy and more than replace my workshop money. I used to, because I like to do all the things, when I would do a show like this, this is from uh, Moorhead, Kentucky, it's the Appalachian Holiday Sale uh, run by the Kentucky Folk Art Center. I would put like a lot of the things, like if I was into, you know, knitting that, you know, uh, fingerless mittens, I throw those in. So uh, one year I decided to not do that and to edit, edit, edit down so that I was primarily selling just the shibori and my sales significantly increased. Um, I also implemented, uh, got from Vistaprint stickers that were branded, uh, branded business cards and sort of really up the ante. You can see that my displays are all sort of natural. So I made that sort of decision to go with sort of that more natural material. So a brand activity that you can do is this brand inventory. So you think about what's the color story? Um, what's your inspiration? Are there cultural connections, gen general aesthetics? And just how would you describe what you, what you do? So if we run the Indigo Shibori through this, my color story is, is a monochromatic variants of blue. And I also have the natural wood. Well, what are my inspirations? Um, well, eco dyeing, um, you know, uh, art to wear, other people who are doing that work. What are the cultural connections? Well, it's indigo shibori. So it's connected to Japanese um, culture. What are the aesthetics? Well, the aesthetics are um, that it's more, you know, organic in design, it's more um, irregular, that there are sort of a lot of, you know, kind of happy accidents. Um, it sort of crosses into sort of boho. Um, general descriptors, you know, natural, uh, that, uh, you know, blue, um, that it's, um, you know, sort of uh, a way to ad adorn yourself. Um, so if you go through this brand inventory and I could do this for myself, you know, as an artist as well with, with more of my fine art, um, then that can kind of help you um, sort of consolidate exactly uh, what you're communicating. So again, cohesive, cohesive, cohesive. And this is, you know, this is a constant progression. So like one of the things that I started to do now is I got a stamp from Vistaprint. So if you look at that lower middle um, image, you can see I'm using my stamp. So what I would do is I would take my indigo, my dyed indigo remnants and sew them directly onto paper. And that's how I'd make my tags. So that even pushes that idea of like more of a natural, um, unique kind of thing rather than the business cards which were more commercial. So I'm constantly, and I just started doing this like six months ago. So um, I'm constantly uh, seeing how I can tweak this and push it further. 
Uh, Seth Green, who I used to work with in Moorhead, Kentucky, and he's now in, in Indiana, and he uh, was a part of Kentucky, Kentucky Crafted. I think he's also, this is a screenshot of his website, also an excellent example of being cohesive. You know, they're, they're all different, but you can tell they're, they're all made by Seth. Um, they're all also photographed the same way. Um, so, so very consistent. What consistency and cohesiveness communicates is professionalism, um, either implicitly or explicitly. So if we want to move on to sort of, so you kind of come up with this concept of, of a brand for your venture. And then you think about, okay, so wh what do I do with that? Like, how do I roll that into basically what's going to be my marketing uh, portfolio? Well, you do that through images and copy. And so we're going to talk about that. And I am going to be checking my um, email here. So this is the sort of uh, portfolio of assets that you want to think about when you're communicating your brand. So you have visuals, um, you have text, which is that copy. Um, you have a digital presence, uh, which can be overwhelming. Uh, my attitude with people is pick two, pick your, your sort of home base. Uh, for me, that's uh, my website. Um, and then pick your inter interaction platform. And so for me, I actually have two interaction platforms that I use, um, Instagram and Facebook. Um, print and making sure that your print, your hard copy marketing materials matches what you have online. Again, consistency is key. Thinking about how you show up in spaces and that will happen sometime in the future. Um, so how do you, you know, interact with your end user, whether that is through, you know, showing up at an art reception you're having, showing up teaching a workshop, showing up, um, you know, at a sales event, or showing up to, to deal with um, someone who will be a wholesale account for you. And then we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to do an activity called origin story, and then we're going to look at um, personal mission statements. And these are important for when you start to have to talk um, on the radio, do videos, um, speak to a journalist, um, because you want to pr provide concise information that's communicating who you are. So we're going to go down that list. So photography. Um, it is helpful if you can learn how to do your own photography. Uh, I do know people who, who pay for it, especially people who are doing quilt art. And I mean, these are huge pieces. And oftentimes you don't even have like the space to like stick the thing up on the wall and get back far enough to photograph it. So I understand that. And, you know, if that's a route that you choose to go down, that's awesome. Um, but if you can do it at home, and this is especially important for e-commerce, um, try to do it at home. And it doesn't have to be anything overly expensive. So you can see that's one of my Indigo Shibori tea towels that's hanging up there. And then here's my uh, photo setup for, for those. And I tried a number of different ways to photograph these. I took them outside, the sun was way too bright, they got all washed out, and then there was a lot of background noise. Um, you know, it's just stuff I didn't want to have in the picture. So this was a solution I came up with. Um, I do have a basic lighting um, kit, which basically is two light stands, a diffusing umbrella. And then this is a plain piece of cotton fabric. You can see I weighted it at the bottom. Um, when I photograph my artwork, I actually have um, a photo paper, like uh, photo uh, backdrop paper that's on a wall and I can just uh, put the piece on there and I use the same lighting setup. And I also have, you know, my computer here ready to go. You can actually see that's my Etsy page up there. 
Um, and then I just have this whole station and I make sure that like I have a fair amount of product all ready to go. Like I don't make one thing, photograph the thing, post the thing. I'll make a bunch of stuff. I'll do a bunch of photographs. And then like for the case of Etsy, I'll just dump them into Etsy. It's also really important to have pictures of yourself. And I am not a fan of having my picture taken. So you, you may have to be intentional about this. So when you do say, do some sort of thing, a uh, public thing, and you see, say, someone like Dave taking your picture, um, what I do is I, I ask that person, could you please share those pictures with me? It would be really helpful. And I just let them know how I'm going to use them, like on my website, or I might use them on my social media. And so um, uh, one of the places I teach at is Craft Summer at Miami U of Ohio. And the program director um, is a professional photographer. And so he would run around in the studios and take pictures of everyone. And I said, Ron, please share those pictures with me. And those are really helpful assets once you go to like build your website or just to use um, in your digital media. In some cases, like with Etsy, um, you might want to use props. So uh, a while ago, I would uh, make jewelry that I was using. Um, I would take vintage um, clothing patterns and make necklaces out of them. Uh, so this is a photo uh, setup that I did for Etsy. Um, this is a piece of polyester fabric that I set up as a sweep, which is basically when you run fabric um, down under something. Um, you can also buy like super expensive sweeps that are made like out of frosted plexiglass. Uh, a long time ago, I was the uh, sort of photographic services or, or digital images services person at the Cincinnati Art Museum. So I was in charge of all the photo shoots of the objects and we would use one of those. So if you have money to spend, um, you can buy like high-end equipment, but I always like to share with people like you can do this um, on a budget. So then you have to have copy. And this is something that, um, you know, as, as artists, uh, we don't necessarily like to do. We don't like to talk about ourselves and we don't like to uh, write about ourselves and we don't like to write about our work, but you do need to do it. I'll tell you, there are two things that I send out the most over and over again. Uh, the first is my headshot and the second is a one page document that has a half page artist statement and then a half page bio and it's on one sheet of paper and it gets used over and over again. It also gets changed. I mean, these are living, uh, you know, organic, you know, documents and they will grow and expand and develop as you develop. So I know that this is a, an unpleasant thing to do, but just know you're not doing the perfect thing. You are, you are developing something that is then going to continue to be, to grow as you grow. So what do you need? You need a one sentence blurb, um, often called a pitch or personal mission statement. So we're going to talk about that towards the end. It is the you, what, how, why, and for whom. Um, sometimes you can leave the for whom out, but if you're going into the marketing space, it's important to know who is sort of a frequent flyer of your uh, creative practice. A bio, a one uh, paragraph about you as a creative maker. So we, we can take that personal uh, mission statement and we can expand it out. We can add more to it and then we can make a uh, bio out of it. And then the thing that everybody hates is that art craft product, or if you're in the service, a service statement about what you do, how you do it, why you do it. And then it can include for whom do you do it. Uh, one page max. I will tell you as a gallery director and someone who's been a panelist, um, I've read, uh, I think probably over a thousand artist statements. And this is what I want to see 
as a gallery director and a curator, an artist statement that clearly says what the artist does, how they do it, and why they do it. Um, very, very basic. Um, the other thing is when you're drafting these documents, um, when you're coming up with sort of the final form of this, know that this is going to be copied verbatim. Um, and, and so communicate that accordingly. So going on that art and craft statement, and again, this is like the equivalent of having a root canal um, for many of us. So you can use a, like a canvas for a lack of a better term, where you can just start to list out material. So like with the brand inventory, like with the venture inventory, don't start with a daunting thing of, I have to write like, you know, two paragraphs about my work. Just start collecting the raw material that then you can develop and sort of build into an artist statement. So if you do this on your own time, you'll put, what is it? How is it? Why is it? And then you could put, what is it inspired by and or refers to? So to talk about my artwork, I would say they are embellished textile assemblages. Um, how is it made? Um, is made by designing, stitching, incorporation of found objects. Why is it to explore the, the concept of sort of female iconography, what is it inspired by and or refers to? So in this case, in my artist statement, which you can look up on my website, you'll see it refers to fashion, it refers to um, early Christian art, Catholicism, um, and those are some things I would mention. So um, when we go into the digital space, um, again, consistency is key. So early on, I showed you some cross-platform examples of artists um, and makers in Kentucky, and then we saw our ceramicist. Um, and so here she is again. So again, I said achromatic uh, with a little bit of blue in there shot in a similar way. She is using props, but she's using them in a highly um, edited uh, manner. And it's almost like this aesthetic, I would call it like kind of rustic minimalism. And she uses that aesthetic across her platforms. So you can see that it is the same, same person um, and making this basically a consistent body of work. So digital marketing, um, like I said, it can be totally overwhelming. Um, I see a couple different responses from artists um, with digital marketing. They, they want to take on everything at once. And like for a month to three months, it's like gangbusters and then they burn out and crash. And you're like, what happened to that person? Um, the other thing I see happening sometimes is people are like, I can't, I just, I can't deal with it. So what I tell people and is what I said earlier is just start with two things. So I know um, Melissa mentioned that she has a direct, she uses a, a, an e-newsletter that she sends to her whole wholesalers. Um, so, or you may decide that you wanna go with having a blog instead of a website and then um, hooking up that blog to your e-commerce. So the most important thing is that you have that home base. And so here's a snapshot of uh, one view of my website. Um, so this is my home base for my uh, fine art venture and its brand. Um, so with websites, um, and we're gonna go through examples of each of these, you want to think about it being like that is what back in the day you know you'd send someone like me a nice folder with your slides 
and uh, maybe a postcard from a former show and your printed out CV and your bio and, and your artist statement. So that, that is what the website is now. Uh, most likely you won't do much to that website. Maybe once or twice a year, you'll add new work, but it's, it's kind of a static thing, a portfolio that people um, can go visit. And then, uh, like I said, I, I have social media. So those are the two things that I mainly do now. I have done the others in, in the past. So um, when we're talking about like social media as digital marketing, and here's our ceramicist again, um, a thing that people get stuck on with social media is like, well, what do I share? And I don't have enough to say. Well, remember that content is, is king, that 80% of it's re relevant content and 20% of it is selling. So you really, again, are telling the story of like what you make, how you make it, other people that you're interested in, maybe sharing videos of an art process that is relevant um, or analogous to what you do. And then 20% of that is that more of like the hard sell. So I wanted to share with you um, examples of digital marketing from my friend, uh, Leslie Pearson, who she is in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, and she is an artist. I mean, she's been in Fiber Art International. I met her at a residency at Aramont School of Art and Crafts a few years ago. But she has started a new brand called Curate Essentials. Um, and right now it's in the early stages of it. She just set up her e-commerce through Shopify. So this is a screenshot of her front, the front page. Um, when I told her I was showcasing her, she said, oh, FYI, they can go on uh, curateessentials.com and use the coupon code curate to save 10%. So that's a little tip for you all if you wanna go on and you'll see what she does here in a second. But here's her front page. And then here is her uh, Instagram and her Facebook. So again, you know, consistency. And here's Leslie down here, right here. So it is, you know, people are buying from a person. People are engaging with you as a creative, as a person. So it is helpful to show, to show you um, and to always sort of put you in, in that story. Um, so people, you know, they're, they're buying in part because they have a relationship with you. Um, the majority of art sales that I make anymore come out of the longer workshops that I teach, like at the John C. Campbell Folk School or Aramont where people get to know me. So the relationship um, part is, is key. You wanna keep a consistency between your digital and your print. So this is my fine art brand. So here's my website again. Um, just a, a, another note about websites. As a gallery director, I would look up people's websites quite a bit. I would want to see that consistency. I would wanna see a body of work. Um, I would want to be able to check out their social media. So here's my Facebook, Pinterest, um, Instagram. I would want to easily be able to find their artist statement and bio. And I would want to easily be able to figure out how to contact them. There's nothing more infuriating than trying to uh, reach an artist and to not be able to find their contact information. And that has happened. I know that that sounds silly, but I have seen that happen. So here's um, my business cards. Um, I do get these from Moo. Uh, Moo is a little pricier, um, but they have an exceptional um, high level of quality. The other thing I do with these, with Moo, is you can get a, a pack, you know, like you can order a hundred of them, but you can get five different designs um, in that pack of 100. And so I allow my workshop participants to choose which one they want. And so it's really interesting. It's like little market research to see, oh, okay, 
that that image is resonating. Okay, well, if that image is really resonating and I go and I print out postcards and mail to galleries, maybe I'll, I'll go with that image. Um, I don't put my phone number on my business card. Um, I just put my uh, email. So, and the other thing is I don't have my email on this that we can go to that uh, contact. It goes to a contact form that they fill out and then it's sent, it's forwarded to, to my email. If you put your email on your website, you may get spammed. Um, so just uh, be, be aware of that. And here's uh, the business card. Uh, this is sort of my brand for uh, Make Do Creative. You also wanna think about how your brand expands out to your packaging. So, you know, if I'm making handmade uh, goat soap with the goats I raise on my farm and I'm using lavender that I've grown in my garden, I probably don't wanna use hot pink uh, bags for my packaging. So um, you wanna think about how that translates. And again, um, uh, I've been thinking about packaging. So like um, when, and I have a wholesale order to drop off of my napkins and my tea towels, they get tied with a dyed indigo uh, piece of fabric, and then they get either a tag or a bookmark, and it's got that, that stamp on the back um, that I showed you earlier. So to wrap it up um, is um, we would talk about talking to people, and this can be um, this can be very challenging. So um, I am not somebody who will go to a networking event and work the room. Um, naturally, that's not my inclination. So I'm gonna share with you two exercises that can be helpful for you um, in communicating in person, but then also you know, in, in uh, copy about who you are as an artist. Uh, Daniel H. Pink is a very well-known author. Uh, a few years ago, he wrote this book to, uh, to Sell as Human, which is an excellent book about, you know, basically the art of, per of persuasion and engagement. So that might be something that if you're interested in this, you could look up. So a very helpful activity that seems a little silly um, is called an origin story activity. Um, and it's based on um, this premise that, you know, as humans, we're uh, sort of wired to receive information in a narrative uh, story-based form. So um, if you do this on your own, what you will do is you will complete um, this formula. So once upon a time, every day, then one day because of that and because of that until finally that. So if I use my mass um, that I talked about before, I say once upon a time, I was a textile artist that enjoyed uh, using uh, natural indigo to dye scarves. Um, every day I go down to my studio and I'd stitch and I'd clamp and I'd bind and I dyed, uh, you know, in preparation for art sales. Then one day COVID happened. And because of that, I had a bunch of inventory in my studio that I couldn't use. Um, and because of that, I started to think who's gonna buy a scarf during a pandemic when no one's really going outside of the house. So how else can I use that? Um, until finally, I decided to make the mass and was able to pivot one of my ventures. So you can go through this and it does, again, sound a little silly, but it helps you sort of create a story because I bet a lot of us have had that experience where someone walks up to you and says, well, what do you do? And you say, well, I'm an artist, I'm a painter, I'm a ceramicist. And then the conversation kind of stops. So this is a way to kind of create something that's, that's more engaging that will bring people in. So the last thing that I'm gonna talk about is the idea of a personal mission statement, which I'm sure some of us have heard of. Um, and this 
is uh, a short statement that provides clarity, gives you a sense of direction and purpose. It also helps you sort of craft a script in your brain um, so that you can use this in a more informal way to introduce yourself to somebody. So you can see I've used my consulting business um, as my personal mission statement so that, um, you know, I'm saying what I am, um, what I do, and basically why do I do it? So I'm a creative entrepreneurship consultant who empowers individuals and organizations through curriculum design, delivery, and coaching. And why do I do it? Because I want to help people develop their artistic capital into being able to create a sustainable um, venture. So I know that, that that is something that I've spent a long time working on and wordsmithing. So there's a Mad Libs way you can do this. And I encourage people to do this in an aspirational or a visioning way. So you wanna think about where do you wanna be in 2023? So you think about what's that ideal situation? Where do I see myself you know, thriving as an artist, artist and creative in 2023? And then you, fill in the what, how, why, and for whom. Now, in other workshops I do, we use this for action planning. So you have this personal mission statement, you put that at the top of your document, and then you reverse engineer. And you go, okay, what three main goals will help me get to where I wanna be in 2023? And then what are action steps associated with the, that particular goal that are actionable? Now I can actually do these things. I can check them off my list. So like I said, you can use this to introduce yourself to people. Um, so you can write a more scripted um, personal mission statement, and then you can you know, have a version in your head that you use to introduce yourself to people. You can also turn this into a question. So in my case, um, just using the example I'm showing you here, if I meet somebody like on an airplane, um, when that happens again, or at a conference and someone says, oh, so what do, what do you do? I um, may say, well, you know, uh, I'm sure you know some really creative people, uh, really talented people, um, and you kind of wonder, you know, why they struggle so much with kind of turning that awesome talent into like a business or, you know, a way to make money off of it. And they might say, yeah, I do actually know some people like that. And then I'd say, well, that's my business. Um, I, I help coach and, and train creatives uh, to see themselves as sustainable uh, business owners. Okay, so I know I went through a ton of stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and it appears that we have like 10 minutes for questions. Okay. So we can go ahead and start taking some, uh, you ready to take questions, Jennifer, from the chat yeah. and Facebook? Okay. All right, first question. How would you start branding from a student perspective? Well, um, if you're an, so if you're an undergraduate student, you know, you're working on developing, you know, technique, you're developing your point of view. So you're kind of, you should be in a space of discovery um, 
and things might get a little messy and muddled as you move through and you develop those competencies in art making and also develop your, um, your personal um, drive for what you wanna communicate and put out in the world. By the time, in my opinion, <laughs> Um, by the time, especially if you're in a BFA program, that you get into your late junior year, early senior year, you should start to have some sort of artistic direction and be able to have a body, a consistent body of work that you, of, you know, 10 to 15 pieces that you could um, use to move forward after you graduate. That's the ideal situation. At that time, I mean, your creation of the body of work is as an emerging artist, your first, it's your foundational, um, your foundational brand building that's happening there. So, but there has to be a there there. There has to be that um, consistent body of work and I told, uh, you know, I told you you'd get real sick of me saying consistent, um, but I have to kind of drive that point home. I can see Emily's uh, question. I can just um, go off of that, Dave. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah, the aspirational. Um, so um, goal setting. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in visioning on where you want to be. And it could be, it, you know, we're all at different comfort level, levels with this. It could be one year out. It could be three years out, two years out. And, you know, when I, I was at the place at Moorhead State where I knew that I didn't want to be a 60-year-old gallery director. And I knew I wanted to develop my business and so I wrote down that personal mission statement that I shared with you, and that was aspirational. I did that in 2017, and I had three goals associated with being, uh, running my own LLC and doing that as a business. So I would have a goal, one of my goals was professional development. Um, and so it was like, attend this, um, reach out to this many people, um, you know, become uh, a trained facilitator with this program. And so I also did that. And one of my goals was digital marketing. And then the other uh, goal was related to actually growing my business, like the number of um, sessions that I would do, the number of programs I would help facilitate. So I did that again in 2017, and I was thinking about doing it out for 2020. And I was able to accomplish 95% of the things that I put on that action page because I could see it. Now I have to do another one um, because it's it's expired now. Um, and in a more like informal way, um, as an artist, I usually have a goal for the year. Like it's like, okay, well, this year I need to focus on blank. So like I showed you that website, my, my art website and my art business cards. Those were from uh, about a year and a half ago because I was like, okay, this year the marketing's gotta be redone. It's old. I operate like most of you on deadlines. So I had a workshop, I had actually a pretty robust workshop season. And I'm like, I can't go into these, um, these schools um, like, like Aramont and not have my website refreshed and not have like updated, like uh, exciting uh, business cards and stuff like that. I, I can't show up like that. So that was my goal for that year was just to like ele elevate the brand and to really bump up the marketing. Okay, well, I mentioned Shopify. Um, I'll, I'll do Ann's first and then I'll 
then I'll go to Gregory's if that's okay, Dave. Um, Shopify, you know, um, you need to think about what's the point of the website. I use Squarespace um, for both my consulting uh, for makedocreative.com and then for Jennifer um, and rice.com. I, I use um, Squarespace because I am not doing e-commerce off those. If you notice on my website for my art, I don't include prices. Someone's free to reach out for me for that. But it's sort of like when I was a gallery director, I didn't put prices on the labels. There was a price list. So that is more, so we talked about like a little, just a tiny bit about understand your end user. My end user for both of my websites um, so for my art website, my end user is a gallery director. It's Nick DeFord, who's the programming director at Aramont. It's a, a museum curator who's putting together a show. Um, so if I was to be like my friend Leslie and want something that was really about selling, I would use um, Shopify. Um, I know that Melissa talked a ton about e-commerce and she's much more in that space than I am. But with any of your marketing, you need to think about like, what's the point? Like if I am an undergraduate student who wants to apply to Cranbrook um, or some other, you know, MFA program, I'm not gonna want my main website to be Etsy. That's not appropriate. Um, I'm gonna want to have it be probably more akin to what I have as a fine art website because it's showing, um, it's basically a portfolio of, of your work. Um, okay, Gregory, how do I motivate the creative people around me to see the opportunity for them to transition their hobby into a business and trying to, okay, well, you can't make someone be where they're not. Um, there are, so uh, my research area at UNCG is, um, you know, creative entrepreneurship education. And there was a paper put out that talked about how there's three main types of makers that are kind of in this space. You have the hobbyist, the artisan, and the entrepreneur. So what you're talking about is the hobbyist. And if someone just wants to make stuff because they want to make stuff, that's awesome. Go for it. Um, you can introduce them to opportunities and you can potentially get them excited to move forward. You can demonstrate through your actions on how this is enriching your life and you can inspire them. The second category is the artisan, which I'm feeling like Gregory, you're probably at, which is someone who is interested in taking that next step and being more in that marketplace and being more of a professional. Then you have someone like my friend, Leslie, who's an artist, but man, she's an entrepreneur. She, she's just in that space. Um, you know, I mean, she does her work, she has an MFA, but she's just always like, I wanna scale, I wanna make money. Um, I still wanna be true to myself. So this is, you know, for people working in this space, it, there's a wide range of where, where you can be. And you can also get into this really bad space of compare and despair. I'll just say that. Oh, everyone's doing much better than I am. And so I'm gonna to go to Tamara's question. Um, how often do you reevaluate your goals and do you have a system for tracking where you are in your plan? Yeah, so um, like I actually make that action plan for myself. I print it out, I stick it up there and then I cross off as I get things done. One thing that I do now, and I've also done a whole talk on project management and time management, but I have a giant whiteboard and I write down all the things that I have to accomplish for that semester and then I cross them off. So you can see KAC branding basics, that's gonna get crossed off in about five minutes. 
Um, so at the so I work on a semester basis right now, but I have done this on a yearly basis where I go, okay, well, here's the things I want to get accomplished. And I'm one of those people who finds deep satisfaction of just crossing the line through the thing. And that's a big, big motivator for me. So um, how can I learn more from you? Um, so uh, I may be teaching a class, a virtual class uh, in, through the Mountain Association in Berea, Kentucky. Um, that has not been set yet. That will be like a six week, twice a week uh, course um, that's gonna take you basically from the idea of kind of your venture inventory to a business like, you know, I hate to say it, a business plan, but, it, but I do these in a way that's actually like, it's a useful, actionable thing for you. Um, if you follow me on Facebook, I usually will mention things I'm doing and opportunities. Um, I know the Tamarack Foundation is probably gonna have me back to do some more work for them. Um, so I think following me on social media is probably the easiest thing for you to do right now. But I appreciate that. That's a compliment. Okay, I'm going to throw out one more question that I had, which may help uh, some folks. When you were looking at the different websites, you talked about color story, mm -hmm. you know, the different uh, monochromatic consistency of, of colors across the board. Can you talk about like how you get to the point where you have the ability to come up with a proper color story for your work? Yeah, I mean, I think you you look at the body of work or the products that you make, and um, you look to see what is the the dominant or consistent color and style themes that run through it. My suggestion is. Um, if you say like you like to work in a muted um, tone, but then you've got a couple pieces that are like, have like electric orange in them. You might wanna reflect on what that electric, why, why is that? And you may not wanna fe feature that when you're like creating the online portfolio. Um, so, now, for instance, your color story could be that it's, it's I mean, you saw examples with, with uh, the couple pieces I showed in my artwork. My color story, I mean, I would explain it as it's, it's vibrant, it's rich, it's jewel toned. So I wouldn't throw a black and white art piece on my website. Like, people would be like, like, what's that? Unless it had like some real strong connection in another aesthetic way to the work. But like, I mean, I'm using kind of a crude example. You know, um, if I decide to start messing around with doing charcoal still lives and I might enjoy those, I'm not gonna put it on my main art website. Because people are going to be like, what? Um, so, and, and you know, this, this is complicated and it's nuanced. Um, and it's why taking advantage of resources like with the Kentucky Arts Council and other resources in your community to get feedback on your work and to continue to sort of to build that body of work. The primary thing is you want what you're putting out there to look like it's coming from the same person. That there's not like multiple personalities <laughs> that are creating this work. That sort of you have this strong artistic point of view that's consistent. Great, great answer. And you got to say consistent one more time. I know it's terrible. I know people are no, I think, me. 
<laughs> I think it, it exactly what you're saying is it's so important. I mean, when you look at other brands out there in um, our world, their their branding is the consistency of their branding. Uh, McDonald's, you know, even though you may not eat at McDonald's, things like that, but they give you consistency. You know what the fries are going to taste like, you know, kind of how long you're going to wait. And again, even though it may not be the best food, but there's consistency. And so people look at uh, brands for whatever their consistency is. Um, you can't be highly inconsistent and be successful at the same time. Well, and then when you interact with your audience, they're going to also share with you information about what your brand is appearing like intentionally or unintentionally out in the world. So I'll just say, and I know we're running out of time, I would be teaching these workshops and I was starting to see that I had a, a lot of people showing up uh, kind of wanting to explore like their spirituality through art. And while I use a, a religious, I use sort of religious visual information as, as more of an aesthetic, I didn't realize that part of my, my brand, what they were expecting from me was kind of this um, meditative and more spiritual approach that would happen as they were creating their work and as they were doing these hand stitch pieces. So, so that was information that I had to be open and receive um, from my end user and to think about how is that part of now what, like that feedback loop that's happening. Um, let's, if we can, let's grab this last question and then we should be able to wrap it up. It's from Crystal. Uh, what if you create a new body of work, should you rebrand? I, I think you, you should, unless it's like a fluke. Um, or it's a real temporary thing. So, you know, I do think about, because I do do different things. I think a lot of us do different things. Um, so like I was actually having this conversation with someone with the Tamarack intensive. Um, I, I brand my Blue Ridge Indigo Shibori um, and it looks a certain way, it's photographed a certain way, it's packaged a certain way, and it lives on Etsy. I would never put that on my art website. It would be totally confusing. Um, so you can think about, you know, you, you can kind of have these different sort of brand streams if you want. Um, but that's going to that's going to look different for some people like like cricket press i mean they've got like that's their brand they're in one lane whereas um you know my friend leslie has a fine art career um but then she also has the soap making business so those brands are in two different lanes um so just remember that you know to think about that venture and to have branding for that venture. 